A huge thank you to all the super sponsors who make it possible for me to make these videos. Visit David X Newton on Patreon to join the ASCII Brigade. This part is really a bonus, because it's overkill for a project like this, but something else that's really useful about Zscript is that you can load data from your own custom lumps. In projects before I made the switch, like the original ramp, when I needed to be able to look up user-submitted data about its 200 maps, I came up with the idea of abusing the language file as a key-value data store. But as the complexity of the things I was making grew, such as in Phobian Odyssey, where I needed to keep a database of possible monster parties and where they might be encountered, it became very useful to be able to store this data outside the code. The data lump we'll be creating is going to be pretty small in comparison, but it will allow us to avoid hard coding the list of available items in our orb data library. Let's remove all the lines setting up the items from that class, and instead create a new lump which we'll call orb items. This lump will hold the same information that we used to have in the code in a comma-separated value format. Just like the call to the init function did, each line contains the orb cost, graphic that represents this item, and the type and quantity of the reward to give. Back over in our orb data library, we'll use the wads global to find the orb item's lump at runtime, read its content into a string, then split that string up to get our individual lines and data items. To get hold of our lump we need to make two calls. First, the wads.findLump function will get us the index number of the first lump by the name we specify. Having got the index, we can then call readLump on it to return the lump as a string. Now it's just a matter of doing some string splitting to identify and extract the data. The theory of this is much the same as in most other languages, although Zscript does make some odd choices we have to be aware of. We'll first declare an array of strings called lines. Then we'll call the split function on the string that has the full data lump. Our split call will take two arguments. The first one is the array in which the function is to put the split strings, which is the one we just declared. The second argument is the character to split on, and in this case we want to split around new line characters, represented by the backslash and end character. Our lines array will now look like this, and we want to go through each line and get the values between the commas. So we'll make a for each loop where we step through each line in the lines array. First, we'll take any white space off the start and end of the line by calling strip left right on it. This is a familiar string function which is more usually called trim. Then, if we don't have anything left, we'll skip this line by using a continue statement. If we do have anything on the line, we'll split again into another array of strings called elements, this time splitting on the commas. Our elements array will now contain four strings which represent the parameters we want in our buyable item. For the sake of clarity, I'll assign them to variables before we set up the buyable item object. I've formatted the orb items lump with spaces to align the columns, so the elements will contain leading and trailing spaces, therefore I'm using the strip left right function again to make sure we don't include those spaces in our strings. In the case of the numeric values, I'm just using the toInt function, because that will convert to an integer and ignore spaces on its own. Finally, for each of these lines, we do what we did before with the hard-coded list. We create a new orb buyable item, set its values according to the data we pulled from our custom orb items lump, and then push it into the buyable items array. Start up the game and you should find anticlimactically that nothing's changed. The data is now just stored separately from our code. As I mentioned, this is slightly overblown for this project, because in this case the code to load and interpret the custom lump is rather longer than the way we had it originally, but separating data from code like this is good practice, and it opens the way to storing much more involved data for bigger projects that might need it. Let's build on this and do something with an actual visible effect. Another place where we might want to use a custom lump is in deciding what rewards we get from monsters, instead of just deciding the base number of orbs based on their health. Let's say that we want Zombiemen and Imps to give the player more orbs than they usually would under our system, and that the boss monsters should award a much greater multiplier. Our data this time will be in a lump called Orb Drops, and it will contain the class name of the monster, the number of orbs it should drop, and the multiplier that it should award. In the Orb Data library, we'll write something similar to what we did for the Orb Reward items, except this time we'll store the data in an associative map. This is similar to an array, but it lets us specify a name or value under which to store each piece of data so that it can be looped up without looping through the entire list. Associative maps are specified with two types, the first for the key, which will be our monster name, 
and the second for the value behind it. Our value needs to hold the orb count and the multiplier that a monster will give, so we'll quickly create another value object that can hold both of these. I'll call this one the orb monster data. In the orb data library thinker, we'll set up an associative map with string types as the keys and our orb monster data types as the values. Then the way to read the new data lump is very similar to what we just wrote for the orb items. To make things a bit neater, I'll put that section into its own function called setUpItems, and write another similar function for getting our orb drops lump and then splitting it by new lines and commas. In this case, instead of pushing the resulting orb monster data object to an array, we'll use the insert method on our map to store the class name in element 0 as the key, and the orb monster data object with the orb count in multiplier as the value. I'm using the make lower function on the class name when we store it, so that we don't have to worry about whether the characters in the name in the data lump are upper or lower case. So now we have a data structure that will hand us an orb monster data object with an orb count in multiplier when it's given the class name of a monster. Now we need to prepare ourselves for using that data. We'll need the raise multiplier function in our orb multiplier thinker to accept a double for the amount to raise by instead of just using 0.1 all the time. Then we need to adapt the function that reacts to monsters being killed in our monster death event handler. There are of course many ways to code this, but here's the approach I've gone for. What this new logic does is start out with the assumption that we'll raise the multiplier by 0.1 and an orb count based on the monster's health, then consult the orb data library and its monster data map to see if it has any other ideas. We get the killed monster's class name out of the event, like we did ages ago when we were just experimenting with this handler, and then we consult the data library's monster data map using the get function and passing in the class name. We use make lower on it to make sure it matches the lower cased class name that we passed in when we loaded the data. As an aside, there's something to watch out for here because due to the way that ZScript handles some variables underneath, some things you'd expect to work in other OOP languages trip it up. Doing all this on one line will produce an error message because the getClassName function actually returns a name which is different from a string, so sometimes it helps to split things out in ZScript more verbosely than you're used to. The monster data map will either have given us an orb monster data object with an orb count and multiplier, or a null. If our monster data variable has anything in it, we'll now change our base monster points and amount to raise the multiplier to whatever it says. After that, we'll multiply our base monster points by the current multiplier to get our total monster points to create orbs by, and raise the multiplier by whatever we decided. Now, if everything's gone well, you'll see Zombiemen and Imps giving a disproportionate number of orbs as rewards, and be able to get a large multiplier boost from the boss monsters, or whatever effects you specified in your particular orb drops lump. You now have a very workable starter ZScript project. As always, feel free to mess around with the balance of it for yourself, adding any values or special circumstances that you like. Here are some ideas for things to try adding yourself. Boost the countdown just a little by looking at how much damage the player has recently inflicted instead of just resetting it when the monster is killed by looking at the World Thing Damaged event. You could only count monster deaths that were actually caused by a player by looking at the World Thing Died event's inflictor field and then exploring from there. Make monsters drop an additional bonus if the kill caused the last moment save by checking for the countdown on our orb multiplier thinker being near zero. Award the player a bonus for killing all the monsters in a level in a single chain without ever losing their multiplier. For this, you can check the statistics available in the level Locals Global to keep track of the number of monsters present. If you've recently got into modding for GZ Doom, or if, like me, you were stuck on Decorate for a long time, I hope this has given you some inspiration to start experimenting with ZScript yourself. For questions, I highly recommend the GZ Doom Discord, which has always been very helpful to me, and I want to thank Agent Ash in particular for always being around to consult on some best practices. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you can make with it.